Friday University couldn't make it. However, we are happy to have here with us Jeroen van der Noven uh, from Delft University and Sylvain Lavelle from the Institut Catholique des Arts and Métiers. And we decided to give them a bit more time for their presentations, up to 25 minutes. But this would still give us enough time for questions and answers for the discussion afterwards. My name is Barbara um, Grimpe. I'm actually a participant in the GRADE project, and I will be moderating this session. So let me briefly introduce to you the two speakers. Sylvain Lavelle is professor and researcher in philosophy, epistemology, and ethics at ICAM, uh, Paris Sénat. So ICAM stands for the Institut, Institut Catholique d'Art et Métier. Uh, that's the Polytech, Polytechnic School of Engineering. And he has a PhD in philosophy from the University of the Sorbonne in Paris. And he also studied social sciences and natural sciences. From 1998 to 2000, he was an assistant professor and researcher at the University of the Sorbonne before joining the Department of Humanities at ECOM. He is currently director of the Center for Ethics, Technology and Society and associate researcher at the École des, des Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Jeroen van der Noven is full professor of ethics and technology at Delft University in the Netherlands, um, the Delft University of Technology, and he's editor-in-chief of ethics and information technology. He was the founding scientific director of 3TU, the Center for Ethics and Technology, which was found, uh, founded by three technical universities. In 2009, he won the World Technology Award for Ethics, as well as the IFIP Prize for ICT and Society, and IFIP stands for the International Federation for Information Processing, and that was for his work in ethics and ICT. Jeroen is program chair of the Dutch Research Council on Responsible Innovation and member of the board of trustees of Bentley University. So we could perhaps now uh, start with Sylvain's presentation and then uh, Jeroen will follow. of research and innovation and I, my subtitle is uh, From Responsibility to Commonality, uh, Procedural, Substantive and Constructive Critique. Well, I started from the, uh, this, this uh, fact that we are all looking for a new contract, we call uh, Responsible Research and Innovation, a new contract between science and society. And we can assume that it relies on the notion of extended dynamics of research and innovation since we have a multiplicity of stakes, aspects, actors, and contributions, and contributions in, this, in this new contract. Now we have to face uh, the, the challenge of novelty and uncertainty. Research, researchers and innovators are requested to add some new aspects to the classical dynamics of uh, research and innovation, namely responsibility and to some extent uh, responsiveness. So hence, uh, some questions, how those aspects of responsibility and responsiveness are addressed in the main definition of, of RRI, to what extent the complex process of RRI can be ruled by a, by a procedure for the actor's interactions, such, such as the discussion, equity or inclusion, to what extent the complex process of RRI can touch the substance of the actor's cooperation in terms of significance, appropriation, exchange, etc. And uh, the last, but maybe not the least, what would be an alternative model enabling to overcome some of the limits of the current RRI model. So that's a big program. I hope I, I can keep within the, uh, my time of uh, 20 or 25 minutes. So I would like to make a plea for three series. First, the focus on responsibility and responsiveness in the RRI concept reveals its dependence to some background schemes 
that can be viewed as some philosophical blind spots. These blind spots question the epistemic, ethical, and of course political models of multi-actor governance in the RI process and suggest that attention should be paid to the usual shortcomings of interactive democratic devices. And third, in order to satisfy the requirements and expectations <coughs> as expressed in the various RI concepts and models, we should move from the notion of responsibility and responsiveness to that of commonality, meaning here that the property of being in common or common. So you know, I, I guess all the definitions of RRI, uh, especially uh, well, this debate we uh, had also this morning about is it uh, connected with research innovation? So you have on the first uh, hand uh, conjunctive view, you cannot have innovation without research. So responsibility is about research and innovation. Or the disjunctive view, you can have innovation without research and responsibility is about innovation, not about research as such. Uh, whatever the differences, I would like just to uh, mention that all the models of RRI support a more or less complex combination of epistemic, technical, and economic means and ends. This is the, the domain of innovation, ethical stakes and rules, the domain of regulation, and also some political conditions of democratic governance. This is the issue of inclusion. Well, I'm not going to detail all the, uh, the definition of RRI because I think you had a lot of things already on that, but I would just like to uh, recall uh, the basic definition from von Schoenberg, uh, which was one of the first ones, in my knowledge, a transparent, interactive process by which societal actors and innovators become mutually responsible to each other with a view to the ethical uh, acceptability, sustainability, and societal desirability of the innovation process and its marketable products, in order to allow a proper embedding of scientific and technological advances in our society. Um, also, there's a definition from the uh, Jacob with a, a contribution, uh, I guess, from uh, my, my colleague, uh, Yaron, and uh, Steve Gould also. The comprehensive approach of proceeding and research innovation in ways <coughs> that allows all stakeholders that are involved in the process innovation at an early stage to obtain relevant knowledge on the consequences of the outcomes of their actions and on the range of options open to them to effectively evaluate uh, both outcomes and options in terms of societal needs and moral values and to use these considerations as functional requirements for design and development of new research products and services. So we have uh, quite a, a big scope uh, of uh, attempts, uh, definitions of RRI, which is still open, I guess. <coughs> I would like to suggest that uh, behind all those definitions you have two main background schemes. Uh, first, concerning responsibility, what I may call the action effect scheme. You have here a focus on epistemic and ethical perspective on some direct or indirect intended or nor intended effects of action and the scheme insists on the prediction of those effects and the acceptance of those effects. And concerning responsiveness, uh, you have uh, another scheme that I may call action-reaction scheme uh, which is more uh, from a political perspective on the actors' uh, relations and this scheme insists on the reciprocity of the actors' relations and the intensity of the actors' relations. So what kind of gains do we have from uh, RRI uh, models and, and concepts? Well, first, research and innovation are useful and serve some societal and environmental purposes that uh, may be very diverse anyway. You also have an integration of science and society uh, with research innovation acceptable, sustainable, desirable, an, an attention to freedom of initiative of the different <coughs> actors of the process, and a relatively flexible dynamic model which opens the possibility for evolution and adaptation. Now, sorry. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Now the limits of RRI, this is an essentially utilitarian market-driven vision of research and innovation that doesn't account for, s for some other philosophical options. It is quite an Anglo-Saxon liberal vision that focuses on responsibility of actors as a counterpart or their freedom, but that doesn't reflect the diversity of uh, culture, maybe even European culture. 
You also have a prudential emphasis inspired by the insurance mind on security, risk, and precaution. Also an uncertainty on the piloting of the process that questions the mode of governance of change and a consensus tendency that tends to conceal the conflicts and the inequalities of the actors. So if we try <coughs> and draw some lessons from those definitions, we can see that the airy uh, definitions and concepts are mainly a set of apologetic uh, declarations and function as an index for a research program. You have mainly two blind spots, I guess, in those definitions. Uh, the issue of procedures for uh, the interactions of the uh, RI actors. It seems that the RI models call for a kind of procedures, but we don't know exactly which one. And concerning the substance of the cooperation of the RI actors, it seems that in the RI models, the actors are motivated to cooperate, but we don't know exactly why. Hence, my, my two uh, critique, a procedural and substantive critique, um, in a way, uh, be it from a theoretical point of view or a practical one, we have to face the complexity and the uncertainty uh, in the uh, RI process, and you can, we can have the temptation to reduce it, this complexity, to a set of procedural rules of governance. And this is all the issue about you know, rules, standards, and so on. But it seems that you, uh, uh, you, you have a procedural tropism in the RI model that gives the edge to a set of criticism. The procedural critique questions the relevance of the conditions for the framing of epistemic and ethical issues by the actors in terms of validity, robustness, freedom, justice, property, etc. So beyond the uh, deliberative or participative rules, and this is the, uh, the conditions for the reflexivity of the actors, and also a substantive critique that questions the relevance of the conditions for the sharing of socio-economic capital in the broader sense of the word, among the actors uh, concerning the, so information, property, profits, etc. And so beyond the sole responsibility and responsiveness of the process, and this is the conditions for uh, commonality. Well, the first we have uh, in this procedural critique the stake of reflexivity in the process of research and innovation in order to identify the social, moral, and environmental issues. The question is, can a procedure warrant that the actors will be reflective? And the answer is, it depends on what kind of procedure. A procedure of discussion or delibera deliberation that provides a set of formal rules based on argumentation will not pay attention to the actors' context and narratives, life forms and experiences, significance of norms, etc. And will not specify the relationship between discussion and decision. This is the, the, the issue of the performance of discussion. A procedure of inclusion or participation that provides a set of formal rules based on interaction will not pay much attention to the trajectories of factors involved in the process, be it latitudinal, so say multiple activities or commitments of the actors beside the interaction, and longitudinal before and after the participation event, and will not specify the relationship between participation and cooperation, the way people actually work together and the direction of their work. So there is no warrant in the formal procedure itself that the issues will be framed in an appropriate or sufficient way in terms of level or quality of reflexivity. All the more that in all the known supposedly neutral procedures, actually I don't really know what a neutral procedure is, uh, their application requires that their implementers make some contextual interpretation of them which is not neutral at all. For instance, in the RI models, uh, the focus on issues of uh, responsibility due to the proper definition of it uh, can lead to an unconscious pre-framing of the ethical states in terms of impact, risk, or precaution. But the ethical states could also be some issues of justice or even uh, moral uh, organization, including some first criticisms to the current system of research and innovation that should not be uh, then only responsible. Now the, the substantive critique that goes into the, the content of the, the critique, we have a state of commonality in the process of research and innovation in order for, to foster the sustainable cooperation among the actors. Question, can a process warrant that the actors will be cooperative? 
Well, the answer is, it depends on the conditions of the process. A process of interaction, uh, and especially if it is a formal one, a procedural one, will not guarantee that the actors will build a common good, common ends or means, will not guarantee that the actors will overcome the inequalities of their positions, will not guarantee that the actors will trust each other, will not guarantee that the actors will exchange or share their respective production in terms of information or patents, property, and so on. There is one thing that we all know for sure, you cannot warrant trust among a network of actors by means of a procedure. So there is no warrant that the process of interaction uh, will enforce the common production of act or action of actors in a sustainable way. This is all the issue of commoning in the theory or practice of the commons. The cooperation of actors requires not only that they have an interest in interacting together, but also that they have a meaningful working project in common. This means that instead of simply engaging into a dialogue, the actors will have to negotiate and compromise, but also to struggle, pr very probably, on some very substantial points. This also entails that the actors will have to renounce some aspects of their own view on the process of research and innovation. And finally, this also implies that the actors we will have to renounce will not be only the small ones, but also the big ones. So now, is there any alternative that might overcome uh, some limits uh, of the ARI models, as far as I understand them? Well, we must uh, admit and acknowledge that the models of ARI are still in the face of design and trial, and so we uh, we can uh, thank all the people who've been working on those models for their pioneering work, actually. One can refine these models in order to make them more inclusive regarding some aspects and limits of responsibility or responsiveness, but one can also suggest that these models should be changed at a basic level for their postulates are biased or are not encompassing enough. So this is the, the job, if I may say, of a constructive critique, it's not merely procedural or, or substantial. The issue here, here is not so much to temper the negative effects of progress through a responsible process and to produce a re a research and innovation in common and for the common. Well, this is a, a kind of alternative model, which is, of course, at a very uh, preliminary level uh, at the moment, of that I call common research and innovation, and which is not just responsible research and innovation in which uh, responsibility and responsiveness are just one part of, of, of a common process or project. So what are the criteria of this uh, alternative model? A cooperative process of, of investigation, design, production, use or exchange based on a sense of the common, not only on a utilitarian interest, in which actors as researchers or innovators, which means that all the actors are in their own way some kind of researchers and innovators are engaged in their own way in research and innovation within a, a network or ecosystem in their area of specialty as well as in a domain of generality that the latter forms with the areas of specialty of the other partners according to a dynamic path of responsibility but also of multiple construction or co-construction and experiment and there's co-construction or uh, experiment can be scientific, moral, legal, social, environmental. Concerned with the complexity of relationships, structures, situa situation, and changes, but also with the simplicity of the trajectories of evolution of the, the process. It means that you, uh, you, when you face complexity, you cannot just uh, stand in front of it and accept that, well, you cannot manage the world. You also have to find some uh, simplex pass in order that the actors can uh, evolve and, and find their way in this complexity. Otherwise, the complexity is non-human. It's, it's something that is not handleable or manageable. In view of developing capabilities and activities and of sharing common goods, means and hands, and sorry, for the widest possible set of members of the community and, the, and of the society, according to a framework of optimum governance chosen by the actors themselves, where none of the dimensions, for instance, boldness and caution, freedom and justice, deliberation, participation, and decision, is never completely sacrificed. 
So what are the differences between the RRI and CRI? In CRI, the process based on mutual trust is not necessarily or entirely transparent. Actually, I don't know really what transparency means, and I'm not sure this is a very important and significant concept. Not only interactive and not essentially reactive or responsive. The actors are all involved in the process of research and innovation in their respective fields, which can be epistemic, technical, ethical, or aesthetical, but also in relation to other areas. The challenges of the process are not the acceptability, sustainability, and desirability as such, but the commonality of actions and results, in which responsibility is just one aspect among many others. The aims of the process are not merely the integration of science and technology and their products in the society, but the integration of all aspects of the production of new products and their dissemination of, to the greatest number of people. Exchanges between players are not just about, are not just about market products, but also about non-market products or anything else but products. They are not necessarily or only produced to be sold in a market and to make profit. So we have many examples of, of this uh, notion of common research innovation. I just give you a few of them, like open access, creative commons, living labs, network sciences. And I just would like to quote, uh, which is the background uh, maybe of this uh, notion of common, uh, if we put ourselves in, uh, in, in the future a little bit. Um, uh, well, there's from the book uh, of uh, Jeremy Rifkin, with uh, as far as I know, is very influential within the European Commission. But sometimes I really wonder if the European people uh, really read this book uh, completely. Uh, because uh, compared to uh, Rifkin, Marx is a very liberal thinker, uh, in a way. <coughs> uh, what type of new economical system can organize the system? There is another sector in our life that we rely on every single day that are absolutely essential, the social commons, the social economy. It is all the activity we engage in to create social capital it doesn't create capital market. Social commons is growing faster than the marketplace. The social commons include any activity that is deeply social and collaborative. We are just beginning to glimpse to bear the bare outlines of a new economic system entering on the, onto the world stage. It's called the collaborative commons. This is the first new economic paradigm since the onset of capitalism and its antagonist socialism in the early 19th century. Well, actually, I don't know if Jeremy Rifkin's view is correct, but it seems to me quite obvious that it's changed a lot of things for uh, research and innovation. Now, as a conclusion, uh, responsible research and innovation is certainly a first step in the new contract between research, innovation, and society that allows coming out of the old contract that was embodied by research and development models. But this model is undermined by a set of political and economic background postulates and is then too focused on responsibility, market, profit, or procedures. So what we have to suggest is uh, responsible research and innovation is not the last step. In the alternative model of uh, common research and innovation, responsibility and the other focus are just some aspects, though important ones, of commonality. In fact, the reflections on the RI concepts and models can be situated within a broader paradigm in the philosophy of research and innovation. And this calls for a shift from uh, an old modern model of specialized research to the new model of generalized research. So I will not develop this point here. We can talk about that in the discussion if you like. Thanks for your, your attention. So I think we can directly move on to Hiroin now. Yeah, sure. And then we have discussion afterwards. Yeah, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, many familiar faces on the table. Um, um, I was struck by a remark that was made this morning by our chair in the other room, which she said uh, to a pressing, I think, colleague philosopher, never marry a philosopher or words of the teachings. Was it addressed to you? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Never marry a philosopher, but um, well, no, don't take it personally. <laughs> but, it's, uh, <laughs> but and then she went on to say, well, these people live on different planets. You know, the, the engineer who spoke after you and then the philosopher. 
I think this is exactly what is the problem that is on the table. Right? And so, oh sorry. Um, <laughs> I think that is exactly the problem that we're looking at. You know, this is the, the happy marriage of the philosopher or the people who are uh, focusing on moral values and conceptual analysis of all the problems that we are getting ourselves into. And on the other hand, this world of high technology, of engineering, of innovation, the new functionality. <coughs> and I think we need to overcome that. We need to look at a comprehensive schemes that, um, that allow us to do so. Um, and uh, I think it's also very helpful, and I think the discussion this morning uh, also uh, illustrated that, um, that from a practical point of view, it's always very useful to have a good and clear theory or a conceptual framework that uh, kind of brings you together and kind of prevents you from going in all kinds of directions that is very inefficient, especially when the stakes are very high and you realize that the stakes are very high. There are some really big problems out there better come together in, in a concerted way to, uh, to address them. Um, so, um, and then what I would like to do now is, is to uh, bring out, and, and philosophers have referred to that as uh, giving a persuasive definition of a notion. Uh, so that's a definition, and at the same time, it's a speech act that tries to convey to the audience that this is the way we should define it. So it's a persuasive definition that I would like to give to you. Um, of innovation and bringing out that innovation can be uh, to a large extent construed and seen interpreted as a moral notion so it's a moral notion and it's hijacked often by people who are just you know exhilarated and very enthusiastic about the new technology and the gadget XYZ but actually when you um, give a certain construal of it, it brings out that it is that it is in its um, it's not, but uh, it, it, is, it is deep down, could be seen as a moral notion. Now the first uh, thing, as a, as a Dutch example, uh, people have pointed out to me that it won a prize in Paris. It's a Dutch fair phone. And um, I think it's a very interesting example of what I would like to bring out. Um, so what's, uh, what's, what's fair about it? Well, look at all the little kind of labels that are attached to it. So it's conflict-free, tin and tentatum. A routable operating system, worker welfare program, replaceable battery, e-waste program, etc., etc. And now they're starting to build more features into it that we, in an ordinary way, look at as ethical or responsible ways of, of, of arriving at a new design for it. So what this little kind of device does, in one fell <coughs> swoop, in itself, it embodies all kinds of ethical requirements. It, it, it lives up to those expectations, those moral expectations that we have from a point of sustainability, safety, efficiency, fairness, all of these things in one design. Now that's the, I think, a very distinctive aspect of what we're trying to get at with responsible research and innovation, which sets it apart from all the ways and schemes and theories that we've had in the past thinking about the ethical and social and legal aspects of technology, which were very good, very helpful. But this is, I think, what is what's different. It's a design perspective, and it is trying to do all of the things that we want at the same time. This is the reason why people often call things smart, because it's pointing in a direction that we've managed to square a circle. We've managed to get all of those things that we think are our responsibilities, the things that we ought to do, in one device. Um, now, and, by the way, it's geared at word, towards sustainable development goals, but all the things that we, we have identified as real grand challenges. Right? So it's doing that, and by the way, you're proceeding in a way that is responsible. If you audit that organization, it's not killing people in order to achieve that, etc. Now look at where a lot of the innovations come from. Silicon Valley, motor of innovation. It's Elon Musk, it's Bill Gates, it's, it's Zuckerberg. They sit uh, you know, at their dinner parties and they dream of wonderful projects. Um, but have they addressed grand challenges? Um, are they proceeding in a responsible way? Have they done, gone through all the things that we kind of identified as part, being part of a responsible process? Probably not. Uh, ostensibly not. Um, 
This is uh, Elon Musk's Hyperloop competition. So uh, kind of uh, shuffle people through a little kind of uh, you know, uh, carbon tube uh, with a speed of 2,000 kilometers an hour. Great, so you organize competitions, people do this. Uh, but is that responsible innovation? It's an interesting idea uh, for a dinner party. You know, this, uh, actually, students in Delft are working on it, but are, are, perhaps it could be a uh, yeah. catastrophe. Is it sustainable? Is it, is it, is it safe? Is it so <clears throat> it is sold as such, but I've seen um, to date no kind of uh, analysis that would, uh, would measure up to our standards. Um, so the first question is, it, it looks smart and innovative and, 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 and sexy, but is it, is it also good? Does it help to, uh, to solve our grand challenges? And we know what they are, and now we've, uh, we've uh, phrased them and, and defined them in terms of sustainable development goals, and the world community seems to be backing those sustainable development goals, a very detailed schedule of what we need to do in order to make the world a better place. Um, very useful. And by the way, coming back to the discussion we had this morning about involving industry, there is a global compact of world businesses that have actually signed on to these U UN Global Development Goals and are trying to uh, achieve them. Um, and every high-level meeting in the context of Sustainable Development Goals will have a two-day meeting just devoted to applied science, engineering, technology, and innovation. Because even in New York at the, at the office of the General uh, Assembly, uh, people have now, from the diplomats, have found out that technology is going to be a very important ingredient of strategies to achieve our sustainable development goals. So this is where we need to be. This is where this community needs to be, insert itself. Uh, because the discourse uh, about where the world's going and how to change the world will be, uh, to a large extent, uh, in, uh, reframed in terms of the sustainable development goals. And it's interesting to see, also relating to what you um, kind of draw, uh, drew our attention to, and I think correctly, is that we had people, planet, profit, uh, and, and peace and partnership are, are, in, uh, are added to it. But the third bullet is now um, uh, phrased in terms of prosperity and flourishing lives. So people have actually listened to people like Amartya Sen, who have talk, talked about social justice and, 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 and distributive justice and equity, um, and said, so, well, <clears throat> we need to help ourselves to a much broader category. Even economists are now saying, it's not GDP, simply. It's, it's just about, look at the state of your country, look at the infrastructure, look, look at your healthcare system, you know, what, what, what what would you need to do and invest in order to bring this uh, to a level where people are, you know, um, are flourishing and leading flourishing lives? So we need to help ourselves to a much broader. And so that seems to have landed over there. Um, so this uh, uh, Paul Mon, an ex uh, former CEO of uh, Unilever, is uh, is in touch with the uh, Monkey Moon, and he's leading this global compact um, and leading. Uh, big industries in, towards these goals. This is on the, on the left-hand side, this is the former Prime Minister of the Netherlands, uh, young Peter Balkenende. Um, and we're working together with the Dutch Research Council. <coughs> so we're trying to create overlaps. And by the way, this is a program that we started, and I'm looking at the representative of NVO, Jasper Ollinger, but um, uh, already seven, eight years ago with this, uh, with this idea. We call it responsible innovation. And, uh, I think the European Commission has, has learned from this and wanted to, uh, to uh, establish a, a similar scheme of what we've done, actually. Um, so yes, we can ought and do increasingly try to solve uh, grand challenges by innovation. That's just a fact, a fact of the matter. We can ought and do increasingly use moral values as non-functional or supra-functional requirements in our engineering design. I will explain that later a little bit in detail. And innovation is thereby coming an important moral concept in the sense that it is concerned with the amplification of the set of obligations that we can satisfy. And that is a definition of moral progress. So by proceeding in this particular way, what we can do is we amplify the set of responsibilities or obligations that we can satisfy. Now that is at least a minimal definition of moral progress. If you go from a situation where you can satisfy only your sustainability, uh, obligations toward fu future generations, but not safety obligations to the present population, and, and you can move to a world where you can do both, you've made moral progress. Of course, there are a lot of, probably a lot of other obligations that you have not yet set satisfied. And the thing is, is that 
technology, and this is sometimes <coughs> not appreciated enough, I think, by the moral philosophers, uh, technology and innovation can be a real game changer in this respect. It can change the world in such a way that we can make moral progress. Philosophers always call this a technical fix. You haven't solved the real dilemma, but you have just changed the world in such a way that now suddenly we can do much more of the things that we feel obligation to. Um, uh, the Netherlands has many, um, it's not just chauvinism or parochial, but it, it's just, I happen to be acquainted with some of those examples that I, I think are, are good uh, examples of, of, of this, uh, this notion of, um, of responsible innovation, where you add new functionality in the world that wasn't there before, and that allow you to do a couple of things at the same time. And there, you know, you're making some progress. Um, so this is uh, coastal works, and uh, people want to go to the beach, and more and more people want to go to the beach. So, and we needed to firm up the, uh, the dune area. So what we've done is integrated uh, parking garages into uh, the natural environment. So this is combining a couple of things that we want to do uh, in a way that is you know, interesting and amplifies the set of things that we think we need to do. Uh, tidal energy plants in the southern part of the southwest part of the Netherlands, where you have a storm surge barrier there. Uh, but the storm surge barrier is a device that man allows you to manage the ecosystem and have the right ratio of, of sweet and brackish water and salt water. And at the same time, it also generates power. So, so it does three things at the same time. It's safety, protecting the Dutch people from being flooded. It is generating uh, sustainable, renewable energy and it allows you to manage the ecosystem. Three things that you want, and it's solved by one design, a clever design. This is the reason we call it a smart design, like with the Fairphone. Um, so now we're re redesigning a big, long waterworks in the northern part of the country. So a 30 kilometer uh, dike. Right? Um, so we're building with nature. Also the Dutch Research Council uh, has a program that is called Building with Nature. So it's accommodating wildlife, bird life, bird changery, fishes. This is what you see is, uh, to accommodate fishes migrating. It, it, it has a lot of, of the newest renewable energy designed into it. And it uh, accommodates people who want to move around and recreate and, 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 and love wildlife, as I, as I said. So um, that's the thing that I would like to bring out about responsible innovation. This is the definition that you also had, but in slightly more detail about uh, what we advise in the European Commission in this uh, report, it's called Strengthening Options. Um, and that's the PDF is online. And this, this is where it started. Uh, so if you would call an organization, a process or a system innovative, right, or, um, uh, and, and, you call, and you would like to call it responsible, then one part, important part of that meaning is, is that the people who are running around, dreaming things up, doing certain things, um, doing R&D, doing development, uh, must be accommodated qua moral persons. Right? Somehow, that must be a, an, an, an environment that is not hostile to them as moral persons. And more specifically, they must have been enabled in that process, organization, system, as um, being able to get the relevant information look at the consequences of all the outcomes, to identify the outcomes, right? weigh them in particular ways that they think are appropriate and fit. Um, line up the option. Often what you hear is, oh, I, we didn't have an option. We wanted, uh, had a very short time to market. We, our, our competitors were going there, so we had to do this, or this was the only option we had. That is a, 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 an important case of bad faith. Mauvaise voie, you're just reducing, you're not living up to the full range of options that, 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 are, that are there. So, so they must have been accommodated in that sense. And then, now we want to get rid of that, yeah. Um, then they must have been enabled and accommodated in assessing and evaluating all of the things that are mentioned under A in terms of moral values, right? So this is where ethics comes in and allows them to be ethical because they, you know, is this, 
Uh, so how's the well-being, the happiness, the safety, the security of people involved? Is this a just and fair and equitable solution? Is it accountable? How does it affect democratic arrangements, etc., etc.? Is it efficient? Is it creating jobs? Is it making European citizens more happy? By the way, what is it? What, what are the effects for the developing world? Is it making people here happy, but people have unhappy there? All of these things, unfortunately, we can make it more easy. That's as uh, Michael Davis said of, uh, this morning, uh, with uncertainty and complexity, it's a fact of life. Ethics, this is a fact of life. This is what ethics is about. This is what you need to do. If you're a full-fledged moral person involved in innovative processes, then this is what is required of you. If you fall short of that, you're, you're falling short of being a full-fledged moral person, exercising his moral responsibility. Um, but now, point C is the distinctive feature, because this is required of us all of the time, right? This is what, what makes it so burdensome that Sartre said, you know, we want to escape from that burden, and we want to pretend as if we, have, we don't have any options. That is what he called bad faith. Um, <coughs> but we have to use those considerations that we have painstakingly uh, are articulated, use them to inform the things that we are designing. So we, we think that we should do it this way and that these people need to be taken care of and that these interests need to be taken into account. Now let's make things, uh, certain things, innovations, new technology, new functionality in such a way that they express all of these considerations that we have. This is the nexus that we're looking at. This is where, why I started with pointing out that we need to straddle both worlds, the world of the engineer and the world of the good willing citizen or the moral philosopher, because it's in the marriage of the two that we can make progress, not if, if they're just shouting at each other or confused about what they're up to. So um, let's go to the next one. So can we build our values into our technologies? Can engineers do that? Can philosophers, ethicists, political scientists um, um, help them to do that? Yes, we can. We can do that. We do that all the time. But we have to be aware of the fact that we can. And we have to be aware of the degrees of freedom that we have. And we have to seize them. So if you look at IT systems, IT systems are you know, the consolidation uh, of hundreds of thousands of these issues. Code, programming, software is the consolidation of hundreds of thousands of decisions that programmers have made. You know, the hardware, the way it interacts, the, 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 uh, the infrastructure, the algorithms, the choice for a particular ontology. <coughs> every, every level, choices have been made. And these choices will affect how that will play out in the real world, how it will affect the user. Well, he can befriend 10 people or just five people or a thousand people, you know, whether he has privacy or not, you know, um, all of these things are decided by the engineer, by the software developer in this particular case. And we have to have a fairly generous conception of what technology is. It's not just the device, the smartphone, it's the whole thing, it's the, the way we use it, the way it's configured in our social context, it's the regulation that is, that, 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 that is, um, that is associated with it, the governance, all of these things. So we need to help ourselves to a very generous conception of what technology and innovation is about. It's all of that together. Um, so, and we're doing this all the time. Right? And we're leaving it to industry, um, ignorant politicians, uh, naive uh, policy makers, all of these things. And so we need to uh, get our act together because we are designing our world from A to Z every minute. You know, it's very difficult to find, uh, you know, go, go around outside here or stay inside, walk around and find something which is not designed by man. So everything from A to Z is designed. And it, it, it is the consolidation of thousands and thousands of decisions that have been made by people who hope to make a profit very soon, right? And not, we're not led by considerations to do with our welfare, with our safety. I mean, they have to because there are regulations and they will pay heavy fines. Right? And in every world that we know, we know that, it, that, that it's happening. Now, the structure of the problem is what we've called um, value-sensitive design in our former <coughs> uh, employee from Delft, co-worker, you'll we'll recognize this uh, because uh, this, is, this, is, this is the structure of the problem. You know, on the one hand, we have 
value, values, norms, laws, ideals, ethics, and principles. They are deontic things, things that the world should be like. You know, they instruct us, change the world to be in accordance with this. And on the other hand, we have the world of engineering and, and, and technology and innovation. And uh, preferably, we want that right-hand world to be an expression, the best possible expression of that left-hand world, the deontic world. And once we have created uh, a world of innovation, technology, and engineering, we would like to be able to uh, justify and to explain to the taxpayer and to the general population and to the user and to the patient and to the consumer that from that point of view, we have done a good job. So we, we are asked, um, and that's part of our responsibility, to explain what we've done, what we've accomplished in terms of those non-functional requirements. So our engineers in Delft are very happy when you can say, well, go off and make me something which is two meters high and red and can contain 20 liters and is watertight. And they go off and do their thing and bring it back and say, oh, I've satisfied all your criteria. And then you say, go back and make it in such a way that it brings people together. That's a non-functional requirement. That's a, that's, a, that's a consideration of social cohesion. So then they become really creative and say, well, I can make something like this that satisfies this, the functional requirements but now I have to make it in such a way that it brings people together. That is, um, that's, that's our task. And the way we do it is we, we start with these values that we all recognize and have democracy and justice and fairness and, and equity and privacy. And say, well, okay, which more specific norms are, are implicated in that? And then to which design requirements lead, does it lead so that engineers now can go off and do their thing and sneak in those non-functional requirements in the list of functional requirements that they are supposed to work with. That's the idea. And so we have many examples. Um, I'll give you the publication that we have all the examples. So for example, you start with animal welfare. So that's very nice. But what do you mean by animal welfare? Now let's break that down in more specific norms and break that further down in the specific requirements that we can check whether what you've built there is actually satisfying that. And the same thing for sustainability. And of course, we could disagree about you know, what you have there. But then we can have a discussion about what should be there. So it makes the discussions much more tractable and structured and allows you to have a sustained and productive conversation about what we need to do in a very practical and technical engineering context. So that gives you the real traction. Now, so this is what we call design for x and this is the book, it's awfully uh, expensive, sorry for that, but it's uh, probably your library s subscribes to it, and it's... Uh, it's value, value sensitive design. It is, it's too. very, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy with that. I'm not happy with that. My, my, my colleagues are complaining that they, you know, they wanted to buy it, but they, uh, they refrain from it. Uh, what I can say is we, we'll keep it updated dynamically, so we'll keep adding Lemma 6,000 pages or something, but probably your library uh, subscribes to it. So design for X. Designing for privacy, designing for security, designing for inclusion. If you Google these terms, you will find bodies of literature, little journals, initiatives that are associated with it. Because in engineering, it's called designing for X. Um, this leads on to the problem, of course, of value pluralism, because this all sounds very nice and well. But this brings us to our problem of, oh gosh, there will be conflicts and dilemmas, of course. We want that, and we want that, and we want that, and we want all of this. And, for, and we cannot compromise. We cannot say, oh, sorry, let's forget about your justice for a minute. Or let's forget about your safety for a minute. Or let's forget about your health or your friendship or your, your, your solidarity for a minute. I mean, you, have to, you can do that, but you have to have come up with really good arguments why in this particular case you would do this in a particular way. Now, this, um, uh, this looks like a real problem for this approach, but actually, and I'll come to a turning point in the story, this is the advantage is the fact that we put all of these things, our moral requirements, squarely on the table, not willing to, be, uh, to compromise on them, that triggers creativity. Because now we have to do this, that, and that. Right? Like in the smartphone, like in the infrastructural, civil engineering works in the Netherlands, let's think of a smart solution where we can do it all. Okay. Um, and this is what we've called the problem of moral overload. We are morally... Two more minutes? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> um, I will promise to um, use a little bit more time than that. Uh, the problem of moral overload. 
the problem of moral overload. So you're morally overloaded. Uh, and this value-sensitive design approach in using moral requirements as design requirements is part of the solution. So look at this one. This exploded near the Hague. Uh, we were not in it. Jasper and I and you were not in it. Uh, it's um, no people. Uh, people didn't get killed. Some people get harmed. Got harmed. Um, so this was a very sustainable bus. So it's optimized for one moral value. But oh, sorry, forgot about the safety. Right. <laughs> we cannot do that. We are morally overloaded. We have to confront that problem. We want security and privacy. We want sustainability and safety. Right? All of these things at the same time. Now, this is the structure of the problem of moral overload. We want several values. I've just, you know, we have two here: right? privacy and security. This eternal debate uh, now going on here in Brussels right now, you know, about uh, surveillance on the street cameras in the street, the security of the, of, the, of the Brussels citizens versus the privacy. This eternal debate. So if you want to satisfy both your privacy and your security above a certain threshold level, then the, the white square, the right upper hand, is the space for your ideal moral solutions. Because there you satisfy both your privacy and your security above a certain threshold level. Unfortunately, we're always stuck with a, or sometimes stuck with a first generation 1.0 camera system that gives you neither security nor privacy, gives you razor sharp images of <coughs> innocent citizens and blurred images of the crooks, which is not good. Um, or you have a second generation camera uh, system, which is much better, and it gives you a lot of security if you hang it. And if you, and if you decide not to hang it, you, uh, you have a lot of uh, security, uh, a lot of privacy, but no security. So. Um, what we want, of course, is this third generation camera system, this really smart camera system that allows you to have your cake and eat it. To make good use of the functionality that technology can offer, but without the drawbacks, without the problems to which it can give rise. Now, therefore, you need to be really good at your uh, engineering because you have to uh, come up with a sophisticated technology that you can tweak in such a way that you can you can have all the benefits without the uh, drawbacks. I can, in the discussion, if you, I can give examples of how you could do that. One more minute, right? Okay. Now, um, just uh, uh, this is the philosophical underpinning of this idea, um, because if there is an obligation to do both A and B, as we've seen, safety and security, um, privacy and security, safety and sustainability, all of these things at the same time, you have an obligation to do this <coughs> and an obligation to do that then we have a higher order or second order obligation to see to it that we can do both A and B. If I have to rescue you and I have to rescue you, then I have to bring, create a situation where I can do both, preferably, if I can. Right? There's no guarantee that I can. But if, if the stakes are high enough, I have to really try whether I can. Now, this is the, um, the moral axiom of, moral, of uh, responsible innovation. If you can change the world by innovation today, so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. That just follows from what we just said. And uh, this can also help you a lot. Because you know Germany was in this situation: sustainability versus economic growth. Oh, sorry, economic growth or sustainability. People were chaining themselves to every factory they could find. This is frustrating economic growth and prosperity and job growth. Oh, <coughs> lo and behold, Germany's market leader in renewable technology and clean tech. Why? Because they had to innovate themselves out of this problem. They were stuck there with the, the Green Party that was wreaking havoc and complaining. It was a political force to be reckoned with. On the other hand, they had to move forward. And this new sweet portfolio of technologies was actually getting them, getting them, innovating themselves out of the problem and getting to the right upper hand square. And the same applies. Thirty more seconds, if I may. Okay, Mrs. Chairman. <laughs> um, so the same applies to the zero visions. Volvo started with, uh, you know, safe car as a tank, and it protects the driver. And then they said, oh, we also have to protect. We also have to protect the people around it. So they, had, they were very innovative and market leaders in sensor technology, spotting who's out there. And now they have actually, um, uh, this, uh, can you just 
speech is a good moment. Yeah, that's a good moment. <laughs> final slide. Now they've actually, this is my final slide, I promise. Um, now they have, now they have uh, realized that their crash dummies were male. And they, and they said, well, um, oh no, sorry, uh, the, the next one, the next one, that's the final slide. We need to yeah. come to an end. Yes, to yes to sure. Yeah. And um, so now they said, uh, let's make these kind of safety belts. And uh, so that, that's uh, so you will you will miss those opportunities to innovate if you um, if you if you're not aware of the moral requirements and if you're unable to translate them into um, technical stuff. So I'm sorry. To be And uh, okay, so so uh, Aaron, I, I'll uh, start with you. It's a very inspiring and uh, uh, yeah perspective, and so very optimistic and enthusiastic, and so yeah, it's really yeah inspiring. But um, sometimes you know the deed or the the, the uh, sorry uh, the speech, yeah maybe. Uh, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, what happened when you really try to combine different values uh, in a very smart uh, device, but some unexpected problems occur? Yeah. And of course then you, can, you could answer me, you can redesign the thing to really adapt to the new situation. But I will give, um, or I will take two examples. The first one is the golden rice in India. Mm -hmm. That was a, exactly, yeah. okay, you know it, and so the idea was to create a rice uh, with a lot of uh, vitamin D in it, uh, because, uh, um, yeah, sorry, children was lacking this vitamin, but then the problem was like, uh, diet specialists said, oh yeah, but you cannot just eat vitamin all the time in a very specific product, you have to have also a very diverse diet. And then you mentioned the Martisan, and one of his uh, latest work was about the reasons of um, starvation. starvation in India. Thank you. Starvation in India was not really that uh, the food was not enough or was not rich enough or whatever. The problem was the access to food. And so here it was really like a social justice problem, much more than a technological one. And the second example was will be the recent debate on backdoor, uh, creating backdoor in data system. Mm -hmm. I'm not a specialist on that, but what I've heard about that is like, either you create backdoor, so the, this, you might be familiar, maybe not, but uh, to avoid terrorism, the idea would be to create a backdoor in devices or data centers, so devices like computer or smartphones, in order to encrypt some personal data that can be encrypted. And either you can create a backdoor or, or either you do it, either you don't. And so here, there is no degree between privacy and security. It's a discrete, discrete? Yeah, it's, it's one or zero. You do it or you don't. And so how do you solve, how can you be smart when you have like really conflicting value like this? Yep. Thank you. Now, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, you, you're right. And this, of course, is a problem. We know it as, the, as Colin reaches that lemma. Often it's very, it's very difficult to predict the future, often when you have you know, a clean, uh, so you're, you're at your drawing board, you can go every way, and so you have a lot of degrees of freedom, but you have no information about how it will work out in the real world. Um, and once you started to find out about how your innovation will work out in the world, you lost your degrees of freedom, because it's already used, it's out there, you know, you, there's no way to, to, to tweak it in a particular way. So that is a problem. But coming back to a very true thing that uh, Michael Davis said this morning, 
This is no different in technology and high-tech world as it is in everyday life. You want to do something, and you have good intentions, you, you do something, you, you go into action, and then it certainly uh, turns out that you, although despite your intentions were good, it works out in a completely different way. You said something, you shared a piece of information that you thought you had an obligation to share with someone, and now, oh my gosh, it, it's, it's all going the wrong way. And you have to trace back your steps, and you have to mitigate the problem, etc. Um, and you will probably learn from it. The next time you will think more twice before you, you disclose certain types of information to someone under certain conditions, right? So, um, and it's no different here with the golden rice or with, with, with all of these things. We are learning from these things. We know that there are very, um, um, that there are effects in the world that are, are very difficult to foresee, to let a little uh, or predict. Um, and we will have to live with that. And so that's, um, but, uh, and the other thing I would like to say is um, that and this is the reason why I emphasize that we need to think about the technology not just as the rice grain or the, the, the device or the, the little thing, the backdoor in the computer. You have to think about, you have to have, help yourself to a generous conception of the technology. The technology will perform its envisaged function uh, uh, in society in combination with the protocols, the manuals, the instructions, with the, the regulation that you put in place. A nuclear security, uh, a, a nuclear plant has a particular, it's acceptable if only you have regulation and a whole social system and certain institutions in place that will uh, allow you to work in, in, in a safe way. Otherwise, it's a stupid idea. So, um, and the same here, and, and, and once you have that generous conception of technology, whether it's food technology or whatever, a new plant or genetically engineered uh, organism, you will, you will, we know that, that it has these kind of environmental uh, vast consequences. And now we know, after 10, 20, 30 years, we know that if we want to help people by shipping uh, ma uh, baby uh, milk powder to uh, rural areas, that we also have to think about the clean water, right? I mean, that is something that is that, that we need to take into account, and we, we are learning. And I think these types of uh, these types of discourses are exactly uh, that's one of their purposes. Great, thanks very much. I've got now three people on my list for questions or comments, and I suggest that you be as concise as possible in your question, and we actually we um, take them together, so that sort of is also an incentive to be as as precise as possible. So Bernard first, and the, the gentleman over there, and then you over here. And please do take also the opportunity to address any questions to Sylvain's presentations, because there are also many <coughs> things that we can sort of dig into. I, I always talk with, with Sylvain Bernard, you know me, so the institution is City Hof, it's uh, the research, uh, political research center of Sciences Po. So our colleagues, they do politics, not moral. Uh, and they are very strong. And it's uh, uh, very strong and very pessimistic. Um, it was open before. OK. It's uh, first a question for uh, Sylvain, uh, because the session is dedicated on democracy, and we have spoken a lot about moral issues and moral technology. You've pointed a very important point, by the way, trust. And, and our common uh, problem in political sciences is, is the critical citizen. Citizens don't are not in, in, in trustful relationships with Europe and with their government. You you said it's important, but you haven't shown how can we uh, take that. That's question in short. Another question is: uh, you say responsibility as a counterpart of freedom. I know a very important author, a philosopher, by the way, Robert Jenny, who said totally the opposite. Freedom is a condition, so we'll open a debate on this. <coughs> and okay, I think returning to the debate we had uh, in the, the plenary this morning about China and democracy, do you think that it's more difficult to have RI, to have a responsible innovation, or to have democracy? Because we've put the debate here, we need democracy, and after that we can have RI, but see. In, in China, they can innovate without democracy, and they are very, very good and very efficient. So what is your opinion on this? And for Sharon, two uh, questions, very quick. No, 
Oh, thanks very much. No place for <laughs> philosophy. We, you can, if we so no, 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 no. I share. There is no problem. Yes, yeah, thanks very much. Because, but we have these two. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As well, it's so important. Thanks. To let two questions. For yes. open for it's other people. <laughs> okay. my, my name is Mick Dillon. I'm from um, the UK. Um, I, some of my questions are similar to your questions, slightly different. The, so I, I'm wondering whether it is an either or. You know, I'm not sure what the answer is. Do we democratise society to open the door to RRI or different ways of, of organising public involvement? Or does different ways of organising public involvement, or as Sylvan puts it, you know, CRI prefigure forms of democracy that, that then translate back into, in, in, into the, the rest of the world? And I, I'm reminded of a, of a sort of, there's an Irish joke, you know, two people meet at the crossroads and how do you get to Tipperary and, well, I wouldn't start from here, you know, and I wonder if that's where we are. I remember, you know, kind of, you know, how do we defeat terrorism with design? If we hadn't made a mess of things democratically, we mightn't have that to be social issue. So, but we are where we are, so, so where can we go with it? Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Zoltan uh, from Hungary, uh, both an academic and a civil activist. And uh, my concern is that we, we uh, try to introduce innovation into a world where the stage is already taken. So we may want both, for example, privacy and, and a way to easily connect people. Uh, but what would uh, Facebook say to this? So, uh, how to address this issue? So, I suggest, I suggest that Sylvan starts. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Rob, <laughs> for these questions, not easy questions. Um, sorry. So, first, concerning trust. Uh, well, uh, there was a remark uh, that came to my mind after several years of research in interaction with um, uh, civil society groups uh, in Europe, in, in, in several countries, and uh, we realized that, well, first, as I said, trust is something that you can make a decree of through a procedure, and just declare that. Now, starting from now, we are going to trust each other. This is just impossible. This is the very uh, sharp limit to the procedural approach. Um, and uh, also working in interaction with um, civil society groups on the issue of the common, uh, I also realized that the interaction between a variety of stakeholders uh, is, a, is a very complex and, and a fragile process in the sense that if you don't have trust at the very beginning it doesn't work and you can use all the procedures you like it will not work that way um, and at the same time we, uh, we see that um, there's a, a kind of procedural tendency uh, as far as democracy is concerned uh, and my concern is that, is that um, all you know, this kind of devices we have, democratic devices, just you know, public debates in the institutional form or citizen juries and so on, they are in fact artifacts, political artifacts. Uh, it's, it's something artificial, but it doesn't uh, prevent you, or sometimes it does prevent you from um, uh, building a nexus of relations which is quite. Uh, complicated uh, and, and quite uh, vulnerable in time. <coughs> so uh, that's why I, I think if you want to build trust, you have to make an effort uh, in order to build this kind of uh, relationship which is very specific to um, a common approach. Uh, and, and this uh, a procedural device, uh, be, uh, be it a democratic one, will not do it. Such a way. Um, I, would say, I will not say many words about responsibility and, and, and freedom. We can talk about that at lunch because it's, it's, it's too long debate. But maybe on RRI, more difficult than democracy. 
uh, I would say it's not more difficult. Um, it's as difficult in the sense that um, I wouldn't share this view that uh, since we are, we are located in the field of science, you know, uh, and research and innovation in the technological fields and so on, and for me, research and innovation is not only scientific, I insist on that, you have moral research and innovation, you have social research and innovation and so on. Um, I, I think the, um, this is as difficult in this field, not more, not less. It's not because we are in the scientific domain that it would be uh, less open to uh, democratic requirements and, and, and expectations. But maybe we have still some remnants of the old uh, R&D model today. And that's why for me, RRI is just one step. This is the maximum you can do in terms of responsibility because you just try to escape the old model of uh, research and development. But this is not the last step, I guess. Uh, so then, would you very briefly still like to reply to the question of this gentleman over here, but which was about sort of, I think, chicken and egg question about the relationship between democratization and RI, just the one that democratization... So do we need a new social order before we can do CRI, or will the C practice of CRI or should there be a social order? Yep. Yeah, I, this, this is a very good question, uh, a very deep one actually, because uh, I think uh, we are still uh, reflecting within uh, an ancient paradigm and framework. And, and we do our best, the maximum we can do within this paradigm. But basically, if you want to implement uh, responsibility or any other uh, moral values, and you, you want to show that you have actually plenty of moral values, uh, that you can implement. Well, this is uh, this is uh, this is a systemic change. Yeah? You, wh what we try to do with, through responsible research and innovation is to, uh, in a way, to uh, moralize the system, and, and it's, you know, it's like moralizing capitalism. It's so good luck, and um, yeah. the, it will come a time when we have to radically change the system. But uh, this is not necessarily something that uh, requires a revolution or something. It's, it's can be a step-by-step -step reform uh, in changing the, in the behaviors, in the value systems, in the habits of the people in everyday life. And then suddenly, 50 years after, uh, you look at your kids and you say, well, they really think in a different uh, way as we used to think in our days. So that's, that's the point. This is a, a system, a system change, changing the system itself. Thanks very much, Sylvain. And I think we started a bit late, um, actually six, seven minutes late. So we are now, we should finish now so that you can all have your lunch break. But before doing it, of course, uh, Jeroen still needs, I would say, two minutes. Yes, two minutes. Two minutes to uh, address that question. That, yes. Yeah, the privacy question. Uh, I, can make it, uh, I can make it really short. Um, um, because if you look at um, uh, what happened after Snowden, Right. The US American cloud market uh, got a hit by 20, 30%. And uh, the European Court of Justice has just decided that the, uh, the safe harbor principles are just not good enough. Now, there's this real privacy panic in the US. They, they're losing ground. And now they found out, getting back to this discussion, that trust is gone. You know, the world doesn't trust them any longer. And it's costing them dearly. Right now, and now they're, they're wrecking their brains to see how can we build a moral infrastructure so that people will trust us and we can do business. Right? And so privacy and addressing all of these values is the way to trust because trust is a moral relationship. Trust is about, I, I am sure, I believe that you will act, be acting from the moral point of view. As soon as I think that you're prudential or egoistic or serving your own purposes, my trust is gone because you will only be serving your own purposes. But if you, if, if you can, be in a believable way, demonstrate that you're taking the moral point of view in innovation, in government, in whatever you do, you're taking the moral point of view, even if it's not to my benefit. But I really think that you have been conscientiously going through it, made a moral decision, which is not to my benefit, I can still trust you. 
So what trust is tracking is people who are addressing these values and try to do a good job with those values. That's what, what, what we need to do. This is why it's so important. So we are now coming to the end of this session. Um, thanks very much to our two speakers and of course uh, to all of you for coming here. And um, I was told that the lunch will be served in the atrium 6.